And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us straight from Fragging Unicorns Games, previously known for inflicting Gangs of the Undercity on on miniatures gamers everywhere, and now we're, and now res resulting in their RPG debut with the upcoming Subversion, which we'll be getting into tonight. The one and only, the man best known as Opti. How you <laughs> Hello. Doing today, man? Good. Having inflicted people with gangs of the Undercity, I'm back to inflict more. <laughs> Look, if you, considering some of my considering some of my co-hosts, I had to go with in, I had to go with infliction plus. Um, I think I think I I think I told you before I made that warriors joke after going through gangs of the Undercity at one point. Yes, <laughs> I love it. <clears throat> um, in fact. In fact, so committed I am to that to that particular bit. Um, when I was do when I was doing a get when I was doing a gang warfare kind kind of campaign years ago, I actually went out and gr and grabbed three bottles of Mexican Coke just so I could just so I could pull that off. <laughs> uh. But yes, I'm here to talk about Subversion, and I'm happy to be back in the temple. I think this is my either third or fourth. Third time, maybe? First time was Gangs of the Undercity, then there was the big dice panel about Cyberpunk, right. and now third... Did we talk about Subversion. Misspent Youth? Did we ever do that? No. Um, I, nev I never... Well, then... I was already familiar with Misspent Youth, but I wasn't, quite, I wasn't quite sure if there was enough I could really say gotcha. on it. At well, at then least... yes, this will be my third time, mm -hmm. then. And but I'm happy to be back. Yeah, <laughs> and because because misspent youth had been had been around for a while before you had gotten your hands on it, that's why I did that's why I didn't count it in in the in the, in that whole affair. Sure. Uh, I'm not soggy about it. <laughs> uh, I just have a terrible memory. Although you have no idea how much it amused me when I saw when I saw you your work and two other works in Forbes. Um. And it was a, it was a case of wait I know I know all I know every single guy who's who's in this article well except for the writer because no <laughs> I guarantee you nobody at Forbes is ever going to contact me <laughs> especially not, I wasn't contacted by Forbes and I was surprised as anybody <laughs> I only found out about it because Courtney had shared, shared the thing with me yeah it I do get tickled by it because everybody who shares that um, our our picture is the one that they used. So every time that article gets shared, we're getting free press. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I I did jo I did joke I did joke once how how um it se it seems to be we seem to be in a, a strange world where the Guardian is on the side of soulless mega corporations and Forbes is on the side of angry consumers. It does seem weird, yeah. Uh, I, like Forbes is not the the people that I think I I would have been excited about. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> uh, then again, then again, I didn't. I never. Th I never thought I'd be going through Bloomberg for my for my own research because somehow I've, um, I've en I've become an, I've become a journalist while while taking no classes in journalism. <laughs> uh, it's ju it's just how these things can these things kind of go. So, with Subversion, was this was this something who for where the origin where the idea for it predated Gangs of the Undercity? Yeah, I think the <clears throat> the seeds of it were back in 2017. I was on a road trip with uh, Rusty Zimmerman, who does a lot of Shadowrun writing as well, and I I, I think we, we we were just talking about like the impulse to create something that isn't um, an existing IP, right? So something that you that you have creative control over. So we just started dreaming about what we might want to do, and um, not an awful lot of the things that we talked about ended up making it into uh subversion i think just the attributes i think is the only thing that that is really left uh but yeah we started uh talking back then and then we um actually i think it started off as a space fantasy uh game 
but then once we started doing the mechanics and then uh, once we founded Fragging Unicorns, which is about three years ago, we decided that we would do Gangs of the Undercity as our first game. And that sort of was the nail in the coffin as to what our next role-playing game would be. Uh, since this one follows on the heels of Gangs of the Undercity is in the same world as that one. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you don't. Obviously, you don't need one. T- you don't need the former to understand the latter. No, not at all. Um, the the f- the fluff for gangs. I mean, they're, they're two completely different types of game, right? Like minis, minis, war game, and, and RPG. But the uh, gangs of the Undercity, the lore is is really constrained to the Undercity of Neo Babylon, while Subversion explores the entire world, right? Uh, so. One of them is very, very tight and focused in its lore and doesn't necessarily affect much of the outside world at all, while Subversion is uh, basically all narrative and, and not not particular to the Undercity, although you could play there if you wanted to. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I do, one of the things I definitely found interesting with this is the die system that you're using. Because you are using D6s, but this, as I, as I understand it, this is not a hit-based um, D6 system. It's no, roll, it, roll, it's a roll. It's essentially a roll and keep. Yes, it's a roll against a target number, um, but also uh, it's roll and keep. And what we were looking for was a dice system that gave us the uh, probability uh, chart that we were that we were looking for, like the the probability curve that we were looking for. And so you will roll a number of dice equal to your skill rank in whatever you're trying to do you know you're trying to climb a rock face so you're going to roll your physicality if you have a five uh, rank in physicality you'll roll five dice but you'll only ever keep the highest three dice of any roll that you make and then add those together for your total then you'll just throw your attribute right on top of that and compare it to a target number similar uh, similarly to how D does that so it's uh, very much not like your traditional d6 systems um it's it's more like a i said roll and keep you know what i mean but like when i say roll and keep I, I normally think about um like legend of the five rings which is a very different style roll and keep system yeah i'd i suppose <clears throat> i suppose a better example to use would be west end d6 just without the wild die <clears throat> okay I haven't played that one, or at least not in a long time. <laughs> uh, that's the one that was used for stuff like um, Ghostbusters International. Uh, obviously, the big obviously the big one is the is their is their run with Star Wars. Sure. And a bu- and a bu- and a bunch of other a bunch of other, a bunch of other stuff. Um, Bill Coffin did did one called Septimus that used the D six system when it went open. Hmm. Um. And I think these, I think these Zoro RPG that came out that came out a few years ago that uses that too. Which, gotcha. Uh, I didn't, th- I didn't think I'd be talking about Zoro in the in the <laughs> twenty in the twenty twenties, but that, but that's the way th- that's the way things go. Uh, not that, not that I'm, com- not that I'm complaining because I. I ha- I have I have se- I have seen some I have seen some of the old black some of the old black and white films because because of being a night owl and I'm well aware of the relationship that Zorro has with the creation of Batman. <laughs> um, Indeed. <laughs> plus there was that cartoon in the 90s but but um saying car- but bringing up a cartoon in the 90s isn't exactly narrowing things down much. Oh. <laughs> uh, but but yeah, the the D6 system, you know, the or the system that we're using, it gave us such a nice probability curve that when when you invest in a particular skill and get better at it you're it's not clumsy or random right mm-hmm. it, it's not like a d20 system where every whether no matter what your skill every 20 times you're you're hitting something amazingly or every 20 times you're failing miserably we thought like if you are you know a, an absolute master of something then you should be failing period not just failing absolutely you should be failing period like hardly ever because this is like your stuff and you should be critting a lot more like that's what sort of made sense to us so we try to find a system 
that would allow somebody who invested an awful lot in a particular rank or a particular skill to be able to not only hit most of the time, if not all the time, but also hit like above average and maybe even like hit amazingly far more than somebody who would be able to, you know, just pick up, uh, pick up the skill and try it. And then also on the other side of that, if you're, if you're not very good at something, you are going to fail badly way more of the time than you are, you know, going to crit on something or, or do fantastically. So that was the sort of thing that we were looking for. And this dice system, I think, and I don't want to, I don't want to sort of be, um, I don't want to. I don't want to overstate it, but I this more than any system. I think this does that very well. Yeah. Uh, there is, but one th one thing that I am grateful for with with this is keeping it is keeping a tight leash on skills. As somebody who sur who survived the um, the skill list boner that everybody had back in the nineties. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yes. Look, there, there is a reason why Phoenix Command is my whipping boy, and I have made it explicitly clear I will not run Phoenix Command again unless I'm paid for hazard pay. <laughs> yeah, we did not feel like there was any... We we kept asking ourselves this question. There's a number of questions, but um, does this require more paperwork, and is this more fun? And if it didn't, you know, <laughs> if it was yes to more paperwork, then we cut it down until it didn't require any any more thought at the table than necessary and was this fun and the answer was no this is not more fun than you know simply cutting it down than just get rid of it you know mm -hmm. so we did that with an awful lot ended up being very streamlined because the you know i understand the sort of impulse towards wanting everything to be just like it is in real life and for some things that's actually very important and and it actually shows up in subversion in some different ways but um verisimilitude in game mechanics for the sake of it i i've never understood just adding complexity and realism even if it's not fun <laughs> like just to do it and i th plus plus in a lot of i think one of the, one of the big examples for me obvious obviously is the massive skill list that shadowrun's been guilty of for years uh but Having in having individual weapons be be their own skill, as if as if somebody who is a is an expert marksman in say a with with say a sniper rifle is a complete noob when handling a pistol, right? Uh, that those plus some um, with the, with those sort of big skill lists, it ends up de incentivizing branching out branching out into new skills. Sure. Because you have because you have to play a degree of catch up. Yeah, you're never going to be quite as good at the new skill as you are the old one. Yeah, because okay. you had to go, you had to you know put so many points into it or whatever. Yeah, some some more recent um, takes takes have tr have tried to establish a baseline, but it is an issue <clears throat> that ends up happening, and even outside of say we say weapons, um. Uh, I I would always I would always ask the question of does is it really necessary to have a different skill for running, climbing, jumping, and swimming when that's not how people learn how to do any of those? Yeah, yeah. The the D and D difference between what is it, athletics and acrobatics or whatever. Like I always athletics thought that was and just acrobatics one. are separate skills. I I can go yeah. with, but the I just always thought that that was just like unnecessary. <laughs> if if I can go. I'm willing to go with athletics and acrobatics as, se as separate skills because you're because they're separate practices in terms of what they're exercising. Sure. You know, you know the whole line between aerobic and anaerobic. But going, I don't think D and D is is actually getting that into the weeds about it. But yeah, I understand. <laughs> uh, well, let's not let's not forget it's it's not like there's a whole there were a whole lot of athletes playing D and D back in the seventies. <laughs> Fair enough. I don't judge. I will, <laughs> but I but I have I have admitted on multiple occasions I am an asshole. <laughs> but fair enough. <laughs> but e even even with even with even with that, uh, one particular issue, and this I know I'm I'm going to be picking on Shadowrun a lot with this, but bec but that's it's because that's a baseline. 
Sure. But, I, listen, just FYI, I will not be picking on Shadowrun. Like, I, I love Shadowrun. I know the guys, the guys over there. I'm not gaining anything by by picking on Shadowrun. But if you have things that you want to talk about, I'm 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 a guest on your show. Mm-hmm. You go right ahead. Well, I, I say, well, for starters, <laughs> I pick on everybody. Just Fair uh, enough. Just as a as a gen, as a general. I'm gonna tune in next week to see what you say about me behind my back. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I don't. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do that. But I. Everybody gets the roast. Sure. I'm, I'm, fair enough. Because I believe in true equality. <clears throat> yeah. Everybody gets the roast. Nobody gets special treatment. Um, fair enough. In fact, I've apologized. I've apologized to anybody who I haven't made fun of yet. <laughs> I forgive you. Just, w- just with a thing of, don't worry, I'll get to you. <laughs> but, um. One of the one of the uh, one of one particular issue that I see in a, I see in a lot of a lot of a lot of cyberpunk games and a lot of a lot of games in the, in in a more in a more free form style is what some people call analysis paralysis. I call swim. Damn it! You know, pushing you at the teaching you to swim by put by pushing you into the pool and telling you to drown less. Uh-huh. Uh huh. I will admit it's somewhat inspired by an old penny arcade um, bit, but that that whole mindset of okay, you've got this amount of points, sp- spend spend them spend them on the on these attribute skills and the like, which certainly provides a lot of freedom, but it also can result in people being very paranoid about whether or not the pick that they put in here is either not going to reflect their character or um, is going to screw them over three sessions later. And I'm, I know that you're you. I know that you have a fortune system for, char- for character creation and development. But mm-hmm. how have you? How have you guys meant? Have you have you guys had much in the way of that issue, or ha- or have you um, have you guys been able to mitigate the analysis paralysis issue that can happen in character creation? <clears throat> in character creation, we have not had much of an analysis paralysis because we try to so. We, you, we give you a certain amount of fortune to spend to make your own character. Um, partially, we do that. We have everything um, broken down into amounts of fortune because one of our design goals was to not make things uh, more or less expensive after character generation than they were in character generation. So what that does oftentimes is... in incentivize you to min max really hard in character generation and then sort of not uh, not grow very much after after character creation is done because it costs so much to do that it it leads to um really really specialized characters that go against the i don't know what my what i consider to be the ethos of role playing um so if you if you uh, anyway, I don't want to get too much into that, but the, the point is, <laughs> is we we also say, hey, uh, if you're just starting out, here's how we su- suggest you build your character. Take this much fortune, spend it on this. Take this much fortune, spend it on this. We sort of hold your hand through that process um, a- as you go, right? So you should have a pretty good idea. Plus the fact that you make your characters after you create your community. So you should have a pretty good idea about where your character fits in a community and what their values might be. So it doesn't seem like we've had anybody um, making a character that have a problem with being analysis paralysis. Also, we just don't give you like uh, infinite options, right? Everything that you would get is pretty straightforward. Mm-hmm. And what I, uh, as a gen, as a general rule, what would, what would be the what would be the baseline for most characters when it comes to how much fortune they're going to be able to spend on creation? About two seventy five, um, and about uh, let's see, I can pull up the, the numbers here. But what that works out to um, is about sixty five on attributes and like one one fifteen or so on uh, on skills and sixty on paradigms. Some stuff like something like that. Ten on yeah. gear. In that in that regard, I'm kind of reminded of the of the XP distribution that I saw when I was playing Anima. Um, I haven't played that one. Uh, that that one is a is a interesting beast. Uh, 
now one of the one of the other things I one of the other things that I fi that I find that I find interesting very very much very much so since I don't I can't think of many um many cyberpunk style games that have dipped into this is the paradigm system uh -huh. which is kind of is kind of doing a class or class or archetype thing but not real but not really <laughs> yeah we are we are definitely trying to have our cake and eat it too with paradigms <laughs> i'm so... perfectly fine with that i've, al I've always <laughs> but i've always been in favor of archetype based systems instead of full-on classes yeah and basically that's what it is right so if you if you take a, a an archetype based system or or even a system that's just basically skills and, and a bunch of feats or whatever that you can take, you are often um, profoundly unequipped when starting out to, to be able to find out what's best or to find out what you should be doing. Um, and so we make it kind of simple. We say, uh, after you've chosen your skills, like if you want to be a gunslinger, whatever, then you're going to increase your ranged combat right? As far as you can. And that's a pretty simple, straightforward thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, but after you assign your, your skills and after you assign your attributes, then uh, you have 60 fortune or whatever, right? However you build your character to spend on paradigms. And paradigms are clusters of abilities that function a bit like classes, but you don't have to, like, you don't level up in them, right? Uh, you don't have to choose any particular thing. From uh, what you I'm get seeing... to I'd yeah. say they. I'd say they feel more like, um, more like sk more like skill trees you would see you would see in, in some in some games or even tech trees that you would see in a um, 4x video game. Yeah, to some extent, uh, you can you can pop into any paradigm and take uh, options from any paradigm you want to, but you do have uh, benefits, you know, and and certain things that you can't get to unless you go you progress a little far into that paradigm mm -hmm. so it both allows you to be um very very good at your chosen thing so like for example if you still wanted to be a gunslinger you might go into the military paradigm which is sort of the military training uh paradigm and in, in, in meo babylon that that is the one that would make the most sense so you could take three different gunslingers who all maxed out their you know, agility and maxed out their um, ranged combat skill. And then they could take their 60 fortune and spend it in that military paradigm. And they could end up being three completely different styles of gunslinger, which is what we sort of wanted. Like you could, you, you will never make the same kind of character more than once when playing subversion. Um, it's not like, you know, there's going to be a best build for, um, for brawlers or a best build for, you know, bard type characters. Like it just depends on what style you want to play. And so we gave a lot of different options within paradigms and you can pick from whatever paradigms you want to. So we, we try to create a system that's both broad and also, you know, doesn't penalize you for multi-classing as it were, uh, but also gives you a, a, a solid reason to devote yourself to one paradigm if that's what you wanted to do. We're all about balance. That's what we've uh, sort of the hallmark of what we've been trying to do uh, in our game design is make sure that all of our characters are balanced. Gangs of the Undercity was the same way. We just we didn't care about um, much more than we cared about the balance between the different factions. Yeah, and unless unless I'm mistaken, um, spells are spells are even though they have their own set of rules, they are they are learned the same way you learn any other paradigm ability. Correct. Yep. So you would. Uh... You would go into that paradigm for whatever college of magic you wanted to learn that spell from, and you would pick that uh, that paradigm ability that would give you that spell. Mm -hmm. So again, and then this is sort of one of the other things that we wanted to try to do. There's no separate system, right, for choosing magic stuff uh, or choosing no, no, hacking no stuff. No buy-in or or sync like ha like having to have some have some advantage specifically at character creation just to use magic. Right, exactly. As I was saying, everything everything we try to do is very balanced, and we try to use the same system for everything that we do across the board, so that you're not having to learn a completely different character, you know, every time you you play something different. Mm -hmm. And one thing that one thing that I definitely like when I looked through the magic systems was the three the three types of magic that you have 
are not are not they're a lot of games when they do different types of magic, the differences begin and end with the spell list, which is right. cute and all, but it's a it's a case of lipstick on a pig. Sure. Because with you, you have arcane, sublime, and sacred, and each of them have their quirks on how they how they are cast and how they work. Correct. Yeah, arcane magic. Um, not only in the in the lore, it's different, right? Like that's arcane magic basically is taking ambient magic from the world around you uh, and and forcing that <clears throat> through these different um, but you harmonize it essentially. But it takes a certain amount of time to harmonize it, right? So once you start casting a spell, you have to harmonize a certain amount of magic first. Usually that ends up being like take one turn to harmonize and then on your next turn, you're gonna cast a spell. And that spell is probably twice as good as whatever anybody else was doing on their two turns because they had to take a turn to start doing it. Uh, meanwhile, on, on the sort of flip side of that, sacred magic is magic that comes from something or somebody else outside of yourself. And it basically is channeling through you. Um, and you could do that immediately. All you have to do is sort of open yourself up to it and it sort of you know rushes out and does its thing immediately. But... You have a sort of dissonance, you know, and the uh, the priest or the the chosen has to exert their um, their personality and their agency again in order to not be completely, you know, consumed by that thing that they let in their body. So they have to rest for a turn or more after the spell is cast. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, sublime casters are using the magic from within their own bodies that they have trained and honed over, you know, years of practice. And those powers that they have are, generally speaking, always on. So they they have sort of passive bonuses that they're able to use based on the magic they know. Would it be fair of me to say that sublime magic is akin to adepts? Um, that's they are similar enough, yeah. Um, but in practice, because they're elemental focuses, they end up looking more like um, benders from Avatar. <laughs> hey, you won't. Well, Given given the response that I had to Avatar Legends, you won't hear me complaining. <laughs> oh. I don't. I didn't. Uh, Avatar Legends is that the RP game? That was that's the that's the official one, and um, I didn't care for it. I, I haven't played it. I, I was. <clears throat> I felt. I felt that they. I felt that they. I felt that they took the wrong. They took the wrong fundamental approach, in terms of. They wrote the way they wrote it. It felt like they were trying to emulate the TV show and not the setting. Okay, that and the reasoning for not having rules for allowing a for allowing an avatar player was um very dumb. There are okay. some things should remain mysterious, which I might I might have bought if it weren't for the fact that there's that there is a avatar in all but name that also uses powered by the apocalypse as a base called um legend of the elements that did include a avatar-esque playbook oh interesting so that so that whole they they might say that you're leaving think that um it's leaving things mysterious but i didn't buy that claim from warhammer fantasy players when it came to elves not be elves not being playable and i don't buy it here because <laughs> you're leaving story opportunities on the table huh. is the way is the way I see it, and somebody's inevitably going to bring up wanting to pl wanting to play as an avatar in some alternate timeline. Sure. Like nobody, no, nobody wants to. Nobody. Peep, if you try and get if it, whenever whenever you're building one a um game off of a established IP like that, people are going to want to deviate from canon. That's of just the nature of the beast. Uh, I would have. I'm. Su I'm surprised that some people still haven't learned this because there was that. There's the reason why um, the t Indiana Jones game from TSR is not as well remembered as the one from West End. Right. Because the TSR one, you'd only be able to play as the cast from the movies. <laughs> they didn't have any rules for character creation, and they got roasted alive for it. Yeah, Indiana Jones is an odd choice, I think, for an RP. But yeah, <laughs> I think it, I think it can, I think it can be, I think it can be done. And West End demonstrated that it could, that it could be. Sure. It's just that people, people aren't, people aren't 
going into that wanting to wanting to play as Indiana Jones and company, it's more of the world in that storytelling style that they'd want to go into. Right. Oh. Uh, because people, people still liked playing stuff like Spirit of the Century, which is dipping into that same area. Yeah. But one per there is one one particular thing that I do recall I do recall us talking about in the past and that is the issue with the with that is, I believe you and I had an issue with um certain cyberpunk games having having that relation having that relationship between cyberware and and magic or just cyberware and someone's state of being yeah that that's not something that we decided was um inherent to cyberpunk and particularly the cyberpunk fantasy genre um in light of uh transhumanism right and and, <laughs> and all the different ways that people are enhancing their body and just the, the way that we've uh experienced technology to grow and to interact with our lives since 1980 uh we just did not feel like those criticisms were <laughs> that's not that's not the the fear that we are seeing in the future, right? So um, we uh, we deleted any sort of negative interactions between technology and magic, and you can have any sort of magic or technology present in your body without it making you any less human. Um, we just we felt, <laughs> frankly, to be on the nose about it, we we found those to be dehumanizing. Right, <laughs> like if, if you're gonna say that, like, hey, if you get a cyber leg, then you are like, you know, whatever, forty forty two percent less human or whatever. Like, that's absurd and also really offensive to people that that had, uh, you know, that have uh, artificial legs or whatever. Like, I just I, I didn't want to do that. Like, and, and people can you know replace their pinky. And it doesn't make them any less human, right? People can replace their genitals; it doesn't make them any less human. Like the, that's an absurd thing that that probably should have died a long time ago. But um, yeah, we don't. We just didn't feel like there was any value to that. As long as you kept, there's other ways to make the game balanced. I guess we could say, uh, rather than sort of forcing this philosophical uh, paradigm on top of the game. Yeah, in obviously, obviously, in some. If I'm be if I'm being honest, the on I think the only t I look at that as a consequence of what once again the par the paradigm shifts of the 1980s, there and to a degree the 70s as well. There's a reason why you see a lot of wood finishes on things, like vi like vi like vehicles, app appliances, and the like, um, in the 70s and 80s. There was a plastic phobia had started to become a thing sure. around that time. And sure. a good example, that's the reason why you have the plastic monsters in um, Pertwee's first story as Do as Doctor Who. Because there, wa there was this fear of, of, of this widespread use of plastic in, ma in manufacturing and, and, how, and how that'd change. Uh, and I guess, I guess as a, I guess as a coping mechanism, you started you start seeing a bunch of stuff with wood finishes to try and counter <laughs> to try and counter that, and, and then wood finishes that that were made of plastic but look like wood. <laughs> um, a lot, yeah, a lot of them, a lot of them just look like just look like wood, which is um, it. Some some might say some might say some might say is kind of kind of missing kind of missing the point, but it was more about it was more about the aesthetic of wood being that being this familiar thing. Oh, <laughs> that makes you want to make a a guy who has his, all of his cyberware made out of wood because <laughs> well, then, got... then you ju then you would just have. <laughs> I think I think if you wanted to go full in with that, you have not you have it that not as cyberware is made of wood, but that he puts wood finishes and 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 right. wood paint jobs on his <laughs> on his on his yeah. on his cyberware. Yeah, um, the the appearance of 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 old. <laughs> um, so that when he's punching somebody, he can say you he can say, well, it's not the first time you took that much wood to the face, is it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> And I know some people are saying that's that joke is horrible. It is. I regret nothing. I apologize for nothing. <laughs> but but the 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 reason I bring that up is 
that sort of that sort of mindset of this fear of this fear of techno of widespread technology o overtaking in in that regard was something that was born in the 80s but doesn't really re doesn't really resonate as technology right. as technology developed i don't want to it's I, I don't it's want misplaced, to... yeah. right? It's it, the, the technology, uh, runaway technology, and unintended consequences of technology is absolutely important to talk about. Uh, that's that's as relevant as ever. But the sort of fear that technology is going to make us less human, and maybe we should be careful about like what we do to our bodies, like that is has not aged as well. Yeah. And i I don't want to try. I don't want to try and say it's it. The, try and use the modern art modern audience argument because because modernity is always going is always going to change sure uh, but it is but i've i mentioned this to you before we went live there's a lot of what people consider traditional or what you have to do with cyberpunk that i have a reasonable doubt whether or not that's actually the case and i've yeah I, that's what that's right. why i did the whole non dystopian cyberpunk I, idea which uh, which, which um, is was an interesting experiment that was more fo it was more focused on challenging how much was actually necessary and in the process I learned how how much people use what they consider necessary as a security blanket Linus if sure you will. yep to to me um, you, this is unsolicited you didn't ask for this but uh, to me cyberpunk is it it, it it's <laughs> uh, Aside from the aesthetic, right? Because if I can look at something and go like, oh, that's cyberpunk, right? We can all do that. And that's just, that's an aesthetic, but that's very surface, right? But aside from that sort of, just sort of visual layer of cyberpunk, um, if you are questioning capitalism, if and you are also questioning uh, unthought about technology, right? Like sort of non-arbitrated uh, assumption that technology is good. If you're questioning that, and also questioning the uh, the place of power in society, right? Like who has it, the the wealth gap between the rich and the poor, and like what people on the bottom are willing to do to get it, and what people on the top are willing to do to keep it. Like those things, to me, only to me, maybe are are hallmarks of cyberpunk. You could probably do those things in other genres, but if you're not doing those things, it's probably not shatter, uh, cyberpunk. This was this was the approach. I, this was the approach I took, and. Some may call this heretical, but I've made I've made a career on pushing buttons. <laughs> it is a halfway it is a halfway point or a middle ground point between the technophobic and the technophilic. That's one that's one angle. The other is the concept of technology being street level, being uh -huh. so, being something that anyone anyone can create, and more importantly, anyone can customize. Hence the punk part right yeah that high-tech low life gets at the intersection of runaway technology and people who lack power right so for some reason the poorest folk among us are still able to have access to cell phones because cell phones are how are, are part and parcel of how they are also controlled and how they are marketed to and how they end up spending things so you know it it, it does it does feel really really weird right um but yeah, I think I agree with you. I think I yeah. think that's that's a good good way to go. Um, I I ended up using that definition because go going with say go, going with because I, because um again I wanted to challenge how how far the concept could, how far concepts could be stretched, and with now bringing this back to the whole cyberware thing, there's been there's been two schools of thought for the longest time. One of them is. You take cyberware, you're gonna be le you're gonna be less able to do magic. The other is you take cyberware, you're gonna you're you're gonna be running the you're gonna be running the risk of um, of being human. And both 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 cyberpunk 2020 20, um, well these days cyberpunk red and Shadowrun do a good job at their version of it. But I will always appreciate when alternative approaches are, are taken, and I'm. Would it be fair of me to say that the primary cost when it comes to cyberware is spending fortune that could yeah. have been spent elsewhere? Yep. I mean, like that's that's the way we've chosen to balance things, right? Is everything has a fortune cost, and and fortune uh, does you know 
a balanced job everywhere. <laughs> right? So if you're if you're spending ten fortune in a cyberware paradigm, uh, you're going to get the same ten value ten fortune value out of that as you were uh, if you spend ten fortune in a magic college paradigm, or as you spend in a military paradigm, or an art paradigm, or a crime paradigm. Right? Ten fortune is ten fortune, and while those abilities will feel very different, right? They're not just skinned differently across the different paradigms you're certainly not going to be overpowered because you took cyberware over art or whatever right you're just you just have completely different abilities but they're all balanced that's that's the sort of route we've chosen to go yeah and that may, that that's that certainly make that certainly makes sense and i'd and i'd and having having it where where everything all roads lead to for, lead to fortune regarding regardless of what sort of mater, material you get um one particular thing i wanted to dip into when it comes to magic because i i it slipped my mind earlier sure is the is the is the cost obvious obviously in some some games will have it that there is a, that there is a specific resource that you're draining whenever you're using magic. Some will do the you get tired as you ca as you cast spells. Um, some will have some will have it where you have to pre where you have to prep and you have to prep your spells in advance and have to go have to go a long time waiting in order to in order to use them for some reason. No, I'm not sure. getting over that. <laughs> um, what where where does um. Where does sub where does subversions types of magic fall into that paradigm? Uh, we treat magic aside from the the flavor and the you know things that we've already talked about as far as the ways you use them. Um, they're basically like any other ability. You can use them in the same way that somebody shoots a gun or swings a bat, right? Like you don't have to have any sort of built up mana or whatever. Uh, aside from the fact that uh, arcane mages. Had, do have to spend a turn in the moment to you know harmonize uh, the particular mana they want to use, but otherwise you know there's no restrictions on you know how many times you can use it or how much mana you have or you know anything like that. Yeah, oh. which is again another thing that just a, a balance issue, right? It, if if other players don't have to do that, why are we gonna why are we gonna saddle mages with it? Um, you know, just to make things different that didn't feel. They didn't feel particularly good to us. Yeah, and I, I, I also, I do appreciate that there's a degree of, um, of being of of control when it comes to when it comes to spell effects because you can amplify because with several of them you can amplify them. Yeah, you can spend your grit, uh, which is a meta currency. Uh, I don't think we talked about that yet, mm -hmm. but yeah, you can spend an amount of grit to sort of amp up the effect uh, one way or another. Or so in some cases, like certain spells, you can, uh, if you spend an extra turn, like harmonizing, like uh, you have to harmonize particular kinds of magic. Uh, so um, thermal magic will harness, you know, uh, heat mana around you, but you might also have um, magnetic mana. Um, the uh, mage colleges in our world mirror the different types of energy in the real world. So you might have uh, electrical energy and thermal energy. So if you if you do both of them, right, then maybe you could be able to do a different kind of spell. But normally you just amp it up by um, spending grit, which is a sort of meta currency. Yeah. And when it comes to now, when it comes to when it comes to some, there's some other there's some other mechanics I did I did want to dip into. The big one, I suppose, is the rule is the rules with um, community, especially yeah. since in a roundabout way, you and um, Sinless are kind of dipping into the, into into a sim, into a similar pool in terms of ha in terms of giving the player characters some sort of base. For lack of a better sure. term, so I'm curious what brought you to that. What brought you to that kind of concept? Um, basically, uh, the the punk aspect of it, <laughs> right? Um, in in if we're talking about cyberpunk, right? We're talking about um, pushing back on power structures, and there is a a sort of I think during the 80s, there was this idea that 
um, punk was individualistic, right? You had to sort of not be a sheep person and be your own person. And that led to sort of, you know, uh, it led to all the punks dressing the same. Um, so I, I, I think though, as, uh, how do I say this? That was a sort of really, really surface level understanding of revolutionary movements and what punk actually means, right? Real punk is doing the things that make for a good society without the coercive elements of government or corporations, you know, making you do what they want. So it doesn't have to be um, independent in order to be punk. In fact, the more punk thing to do is to be interdependent on a community that is disconnected from the greater community. So we've, we've sort of leaned on ideas that we are, that we are looking at from real institutions um, anarchist institutions and uh, mutual aid groups and revolutionary uh, groups throughout history. And they really focus on direct action. They fo focus on mutual aid, uh, those sort of things. And we thought like, that's actually more punk than anything else that is happening in any of the, the, uh, the RPGs that we've ever played, right? Uh, Misspent Youth maybe being an exception. <laughs> um, so we, we just thought that it's not enough, you know, I mean, just to sort of, wear wear mohawks and sort of you know uh be criminals that's not actually very punk at all right it it, it it actually would be way more punk to say hey let's question this whole individualism thing um let's question this whole dependence on government and dependence on corporation thing what would it look like to not be punk just by tearing things down what would it look like to be punk in building things up and that all led back to uh, the importance of relationships, the importance of community, the importance of not only uh, what you're doing, but what you're doing it for. And if the what you're doing it for is your community, then not only what you do changes, right, but how you do it changes. So yeah, we we once we sort of unlock that, you know, the relationships and the community bit, um, the game feels much much different from say Shadowrun or Sinless or Vault or whatever, you know, Cities Without Number. It, it, it really isn't the same game at all. You're playing a completely different... Mm -hmm. You're almost playing a completely different genre, right? Like, it, they're... They, uh, again, not slamming it. You know I've written for Shadowrun. You know I love Shadowrun. Um, but they are cyberpunk, right? And we're cyberpunk, if that makes any sense. <laughs> uh I can, I can, I can certainly work. I can certainly work with it. <laughs> That's how we frame it. Or cyberpunk in the daytime, or cyberpunk with all the colors. <laughs> yeah. Cyberpunk with a hundred percent less rain. <laughs> sure. <laughs> like, it now, doesn't always rain in Neo Babylon. <laughs> no, and that's that's another thing that I find I found kind of interesting is using. Using um using a more Babylonian aesthetic, yeah. And part of the reason I find that interesting is, I'd say the on the only other game I can, the last game that I've had that I've had on the I've had in the temple that dipped into that particular area would probably be Black Void. I haven't played that one. Black Void is is um. I is I'd say I I'd say kind of straddling the line between between fantasy and SF. It is very it is very pulpy, but it has a it takes a lot of its influence from Sum, from um, Sumerian culture. Okay. I've I've had I've had the guy behind it on on the show a couple times and had to deal with time zone hell because he's on the other side of the world. <laughs> but the, but um, that's that's the that's the approach that it ha that it has, and it is it is fairly free it is fairly free form. So you guys have that in common. But mm. what made you go with what made you go with Babylon as the as the aesthetic? Um, so that happened in sort of two steps. Um, I absolutely love uh, Mesopotamian culture and mythology and history. So that was always in my in my blood and in my background. But um, when we were coming up with names for the city, uh, I I was sort of 
in this <laughs> sort of in this reggae ska place, right? And the primary metaphor that reggae and ska use for um, capitalism or the American empire is Babylon, right? They just say, you know, beat, beat down Babylon or we're, you know, we're going to burn Babylon or whatever. Like that's the sort of just metaphor that they use. Um, and that metaphor has also been used like throughout history, like in the first century, Christians used the metaphor of Babylon for um, over the Roman empire. Right. And if you go back further, like there's another, um, you know, actually like, like, like Jewish folk and Jewish literature, you know, talks about their, their uh, exile in Babylon. So, so Babylon has this sort of cultural understanding as being a sort of uh, evil empire, or at very least a sort of oppressive, you know, elite uh exile ex exilic type force so i i thought neo babylon would be a cool cyberpunk version of that um and then of course we asked ourselves like okay in a in a world that's not ours how do we get to the point where somebody names a city neo babylon like what why was babylon so important to them that they wanted to create a new version uh and then once we asked that question my passion for mesopotamian uh history and mythology kicked in and i was like oh that's it like so instead of having magic sort of emerge like you know into a cyberpunk world what if we say magic has always been around and the babylonians were the first to sort of uh wield that in in a global sense and start applying pressure and what if babylon didn't fall you know in 530 bce or whatever what if they kept going because of this use of magic and that became the jumping off point for us uh, as far as the world and then it became a question of uh, by the way don't do this if you're ever creating a world i would very very much suggest that you don't do what we did but then we went through we went through almost year by year like what does this look like right <laughs> like how how would magic have affected all of this how would these extra species and and all of this magic would have affected things and so we we just sort of went by era by era um trying to figure out what might be the case um you know you the know, battle tech writers are looking at you and going too late Oh well, I mean, I don't know. They didn't have magic to deal with. <laughs> no, but in terms in terms of in terms of going year by year with their setting. <laughs> oh, fair enough. <laughs> uh, don't get and I I love BattleTech to death, but uh, but you are you are right in that. Um, I would only recommend doing a year by year look at your world building if you are com if you are completely insane. Which, to be fair, um, jury's out on the sanity of most game designers. <laughs> and mo and most G and most GMs, I've said in the past that um, all game designers are masochists. <laughs> which I'm I'm not going to either confirm or deny that. <laughs> uh, I'm not I'm not saying I'm not saying that's I'm not saying that some of, that some of them will dress up in leather at at um, certain clubs, but there is a degree of masochism and a degree of and a degree of Einstein's insanity involved in the process. Sure. Uh, <laughs> Although, although some although some people have some people have told me that I that I should cos that I should cosplay as Pinhead one of these days. I'm not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it's because tall. I think it's because tall guy. But when it now when it comes to something, there's a few things that there's a few things that some some games some games skim over that I find interesting that you guys um, put in. One of them was. One of them was rules on tra on um, chases, and the other uh -huh. is um r is putting your own rule set and your own mechanics for things like social encounters or stealth. And well, there's always going to be sub mechanics for hacking, but that's always been one of those things that's a problem. Yeah. So let's let's get the elephant out of the room now. When it comes, I'm guessing that. E that in your experience with certain cyberpunk style games, you've always had, you've had an issue with um, hacking systems in one form or another. Um, I, uh, I guess yes. <laughs> I guess there's no real, there's no real delicate way to say that. Yes, I have not. Uh, that has occupied some amount of consternation energy. Yes. <laughs> in fact, I, I do. I didn't go. Th I, I wasn't able to go through with it, but I do remember pitching the idea of discussing the hacking problem because now no no game I th no game I think ha 
up to this point has got has gotten it right. Every everyone has their issues, but I'd say one of the big I'd say one of the bigger issues is tr is treating hacking as this duet between the hacker and the GM because we're just the way people are going to compose their parties, it's not going to be a case where you're going to have multiple hackers. You're going to have one guy as the hacker. That's just how it's going to work. In in subversion, that doesn't necessarily uh, follow because in subversion, we have decided uh, two things. Uh, number one, we are never going to provide a case where the hacker has to be doing something apart from the main group. So no so matrix. There is no VR at the moment, and you know we might include it, but uh, later as a sort of story point. But we have also decided that if you are going to have to go into VR, we are going to allow the hacker or the breacher to uh, be a conduit to allow everybody to go in, right? So uh, the the magic of the internet in our world will take everything that you uh, that you are good at in real life and transform that into you know. Uh, 3D, you know, virtual version of that, and so you'll have your own online adventure where everybody is in VR, and the breacher is just the conduit making it possible. So that solves that problem. And then number two, we are not doing a mini game uh, of of breaching or or hacking. It basically is the same exact uh, rules, the same sort of resolution mechanic as everything else. Yes, it's got it's, it's got a few things that like make it. Um, you know, particular, just like magic does. It gives it some flavor and gives it some uh, complexity, but it's basically the same thing. The GM doesn't have to sort of stress out about, am I getting this rule right, or am I getting this rule wrong, or am I remembering, you know, uh, all of these little details. You know, it, it's it's very, very straightforward, right? Mm -hmm. So we've, we've sort of made it... Um, I don't know. I, I, it might be flattening flattening it out, right? But like, as long as everything else feels really, really exciting, uh, making hacking as exciting as everything else seems fair, right? It's more. It's maybe better to say we made everything um, the same uh, complexity, but also made everything feel, uh, you know, with the um, the the sort of. Uh, what am I trying to say? I think the um, I think the best way I think the best way to put it is there's a is there's a Rome that all roads lead to. Right. We almost have like a unified theory of, that, of everything. Yeah. <laughs> right? the, you've heard the expression "all roads lead to Rome," and that yeah. that's kind that's kind of what I'm going with 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 that analogy. In this case, it's the it's the system of progress tracks. Uh -huh. There might, there might, the details, the details might differ between, say, between, say, the progress tracks of health and amenity, the progress tracks in chases, the progress tracks right. in breaching, but at the end of the day, you're still using progress tracks as a base. Right. So the the GM and the players never have to worry if they're getting something right or wrong. Right. It's just okay. Progress track, and and if I'm in combat, then it's progress track. Of their their health is essentially you know the the length of the progress track. Or mm -hmm. if I'm you know trying to slam somebody down in a social contest, then their animity is the length of that progress track. Or um, however far away they are is the length of the progress track. Right. <laughs> yeah. So it's all it's all basically the same mechanic. Mm hmm. Uh which much, which is why, which is why I brought up the whole "all roads lead to Rome." The yeah. now some there's one there's there's one set of keywords when it came to the skill system that I'm curious how you guys um, came to this, and yeah. that is the trinity of reliable, inspired, and dulled. Yeah, uh, dulled came first, um, and it was our attempt to say, like, remember how um, the basic dice mechanic was? You keep three of uh, the dice pool, right? You always keep three. Well, what if you have a skill of one or two, right? You're, you're, you're not even technically rolling three dice. How are you supposed to keep three? Um, so dulled was our way to sort of find out how to extend that really nice uh, probability um, graph, uh, even if you only have one or two skill in something. So if we decided or we look, we kept, trying different things and, and finally got to the point where we realized if if you roll you always roll at least three dice but if you have less than three rank in something then you are dulled 
Um, and dulled is basically uh, you can if you have dulled five, for example, like if you are rank two in something, then uh, you your roll is dulled five, which means that no dice you roll can be above five. So if you roll three sixes, then actually what you have is three fives. Mm -hmm. Or if you're dulled four, if you have a rank one in something, then you can roll three sixes on something, but you know all your kept dice could be three sixes but you cannot get any higher than four on any of those dice. And that kept that probability, um, you know, in a good way that we like, but allow people to still roll three dice, allow them to still feel like they're doing something uh, and not wasting a turn. And then once we had dulled, we thought, well, like, well, how do we play with this, right? Like, what's the opposite of dulled? Um, and uh, so we got the other, the other ones where, you know, reliable, you can't get, you know, if you have a reliable two, then any ones that you roll become two. Um, or if you have inspired, then you're always gonna, you know, have one more. So yeah, it, mm -hmm. it, it became cool to play around with those keywords and add a little bit more complexity, uh, to an otherwise, you know, straightforward dice rolling system. Especially, especially since one concept that a lot of, a lot of die pool games, I, th I think, I think overlook is the, is the idea of messing with the fi the final die results. A lot of, a lot of folk have the idea of add more dice or take away dice. Which is which right. is nice and all, but that's one that's one angle. And sure. When and I'd I'd say in this I'd say in this regard, um, I think you get I think you guys ended up managing I think you guys escaped a potential, um, painting yourselves into a corner moment. Uh huh. Because yeah, we didn't want to just keep adding dice or taking away dice. Yeah, that didn't feel that didn't feel fun. Well, we we no did try that out. No matter how many die you add or take away, the rule of three is still is still applying. So there's still right. going to be a cat. There's still going to be a um li a lim a limit to at to the effect of added or, or removed die. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, we and we do have sometimes where we are removing dice. So yeah, you're right. I hadn't thought about that. But like, what if you have a a, a you know a three skill and you have a you know, remove one die? Well, okay, cool. Then you just have a adult. Yeah. Or if, an interaction I hadn't thought about. Thank you, Milton. If you're if you're rolling <laughs> if you're if you're rolling seven die and, th and then you level up and now you're rolling eight die on that same check, um, it's not going. If if you're if you're just if you're still keeping three die, which with I'd say with rare exception is going to be the case, your that the impact of that extra d six isn't going to be felt as much. Um. No. Not necessarily. <laughs> not, a, not, a, um, but it makes your goodness more consistent, right? Yeah. Like that's that's the sort of yeah that feels good over the long term. Mm -hmm. I guess we should say yeah, yeah. And the, that's, but you're right. That's... The, it's always going to be three to eighteen, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're never gonna, you're never going to be rolling forty, right? No matter how many dice you roll. Yeah, <clears throat> and I'm not I'm not saying I'm not saying don't don't expand don't expand the um the ranks that you have that you have in this in a skill. It's more of the impact. That that happens that happens with it. Um, well, that's there is a sort of um, diminishing returns, mm -hmm. right? For sure. Um, but that's also why attributes sort of their costs go up exponentially, while uh, ranks are basically a static, you know, fifteen fortune for whatever rank you want to get. Mm -hmm. Now, but we did discover that like it's it's a hit it's a hidden benefit, right? It seems like on the surface, you know, you know, you're not doing much better. But when your person who has a high skill rank is consistently doing dynamic and critical critical successes, and everybody else isn't, right? Like that does that does make you feel much more like a badass yeah. than everybody else at the table, right? Now, one thing I'm curious about is if is if sometime in the future you guys have um, have plans for have plans to create a um. If at the very at the very least a mo a module or e or even a full on mini campaign with su within um subversion, like what do you mean? Um, like whether, like adventure modules and things. Yeah, some something something like that. Something to something to put into pra to put into practice the world that subversion is bringing. Yes. Yeah. As a matter of fact, that's one of our one of our values as a company is that we are going to support the game, not just release, you know, some rules and then move on to the next thing. Um, 
and, and I'm not slamming anybody who does that, right? Like it's hard. It's a hard thing to do, right? And and in a in a sort of uh, economic milieu where you are you are financially benefited from putting out a bunch of different games, you know whether they're good or whether they're bad, right? Just like the the, the churn of it can be very lucrative. Um, slowing down and creating adventures, which do not sell as well as core books, you know, is is maybe not the most uh, financially intelligent thing, but mm -hmm. We are committed to creating shared experiences uh, between players, right? So I don't know if you, you know, ever go to conventions or just meet people in local comic shops or meet people online. And I go to they've conventions. Played... I'm not that scary. Well, hey, I don't know. <laughs> but if you meet people who have played the same adventure module as you or had the same experience with a monster as you, that actually does create a little vibe, right? It creates a little point of connection between the two of you. Um, that builds a little bit of community, right? It's like it's a it's an opening um, to sort of keep keep that community going. So what we're after is uh, right now, by the way, like on our Kickstarter, we've unlocked two adventure PDFs. Um, we plan on making more than two, but these the ones that we've unlocked means that everybody who uh, pledges for the Kickstarter is going to get these three or these two right now um, adventure PDFs for free, plus the one that's going to be included in the core book. So uh, we are absolutely treating this as a as an ongoing uh, story, as an ongoing you know uh, thing that we're going to continue to support, uh, not just a one and done thing. And we're even you know uh, planning on not this year, but next year, maybe even starting a living campaign that uh, people can can buy into. Mm -hmm. Now. With that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as the total page count? I know that stretch goals can futz with that a little bit. We tried not to add any stretch goals that were going to mess with that. Um, we try to keep stretch goals pretty straightforward. Um, and I think this is sort of a hidden thing that we don't talk about in Kickstarters. But sometimes Kickstarters have, they get a lot of money um, because they've added a lot of things that are going to cost them more on the other side. So they'll end up making money. Um, ask me about my experience with Gangs of the Undercity someday. <laughs> so, I, I can put two and two together. <laughs> so we've decided to not do that at all uh, and just basically focus very much on creating things that are straightforward and that we know that we can do right away without having to rely on manufacturers after the fact. Um, so the, the page count is going to come in around 250 pages. Uh, we're going to try to keep it as close to 250 as possible. Mm-hmm. And what are you shooting for as far as a release window? I know that there, I know that it says November on the Kickstarter page, but um, I usually I think it's November for the PDF and December for the uh, for the print. I feel pretty confident. the The book is almost like ninety five percent done, um, and we're continuing. Like even now, we're getting you know feedback that's making it better. So I'd say if we gave it. Um, you know, here, here's here's my sort of off the cuff plan: keep play testing and play testing and play testing and getting feedback and improving up until say October. Then we hand it to layout. Uh, then we get it back and we make any sort of spot fixes that have come in over the last month. We release the PDF in November and then go to print, and we should have it out by December. And that's that's being you know. I don't think that's being optimistic. I think that's a that's a really easy goal for us to hit at this point. Mm -hmm. And I will I will certainly be looking forward to seeing to seeing how that goal um, how that goal carries out. Me too. But uh, with the... <laughs> because we did it with we did it with um, with Misspent Youth, the uh, Fall in Love Not in Line. We released uh, I can't remember. Maybe it was a. Do we have a Kickstarter in March? Maybe of last year or April, and we got the book out by. Uh, last December, so mm -hmm. we 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 know we can do it. You know, with with uh, with books, we are much more comfortable like knowing exactly what goes into making RPG books. But the uh, like, I'll tell you, like the gangs of the Undercity. Literally, I was you know, your listeners don't know this, but uh, I was a little late coming on. Uh, I got back home two minutes later than I wanted to to be on this interview. But I was I was trying my best, and I did. Um, I was at the office and I was 
uh, packing up the very last five packages to send out uh, for the Gangs of Undercity fulfillment. So now I have packed them all up. They are all in my car. And on Monday, I will send out the very final packages to fulfill Gangs of Undercity, Gangs of the Undercity once and for all. So uh, it's it's been too long. Uh, there's there, you know we've been honest about why those things have been up uh, the whole time, and and nobody has complained, right? Everybody's sort of understood uh, because we've been so transparent and told everybody every step of the way. But yeah, we, the the non physical stuff that is you know just books. I feel like we are very confident in that. Um, but if you're asking us to produce more minis or you know do stuff that we have to you know interact with. Uh, uh, you know, factories in China like uh, that. That just makes things a bigger, bigger headache. <laughs> yeah, it's not like there's enough. There's not like there's enough. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if I go to a convention one of these days and I find and I find a um specific port specific portion of a bar dedicated just to people running Kickstarters. <laughs> you could also have the uh, I, I didn't have enough money for shipping. Uh, bar <laughs> the kickstarters <laughs> i'm just putting in the general umbrella of kicks of a bar where people who have different woes about kickstarters go to get go to get sloshed and drowned and drown the matter <laughs> yeah you could definitely fill a bar with people like that uh, we were almost those people right like when you start a kickstarter uh, at the beginning of covid and uh you know you you, you succeed beyond your wildest imagination and then the the price of plastics and the price of mini and the price of resin and metals and the price of shipping and the price of manufacturing everything goes up and, and the uh the shipping may, means that everything extends out like the time between conversations and the time between you getting your minis like it, everything extends and you think oh my gosh i started this business at the exact wrong time <laughs> mm -hmm. but so I'm, I'm i'm thankful that we are here it's it was two years later but i'm thankful that we're here you know being able to fulfill versus you know being one of those companies that just had to go under and everybody just got screwed. Mm -hmm. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple. And my pleasure. Anytime you see fit to return, whether it's for gangs of the undercity or subversion, or just to, sh just to shit post about <clears throat> how bad invisible war was, the door is always <laughs> open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Fair enough. Thank you for having me, Mildred. I really appreciate you. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody!